Good evening, folks. This is Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update on Saturday, March 10th at 9.40 p.m. Mountain Time, 2018. You're looking at the explosive eruption of Shinmodake, Kyushu Prefecture, happening just within the last 24 hours. Amazing footage. The coverage of that lava fountain is exceptional. We'll look at it uh, once, one more time and we'll get on with the update. We'll be back to this. I hope nobody was camping there. Large hail damaging winds expected tonight in the deep south. Hailstorm hits River Valley, a thunderstorm producing widespread hail tracked across eastern Oklahoma and west central Arkansas on Saturday from Nycut, Oklahoma to Cedarville, Arkansas, blanketing the region in heavy hail. But that's not all. This is minor, this one inch hail. Hail is hammering portions of central Arkansas just 12 hours ago in the 2 to 3 inch range. Little Rock, Arkansas, Saturday storms dumped hail across portions of central Arkansas, causing some damage. <laughs> I bet. Sure to cost home and car owners. The damage reports are just coming in. Windows broken, with cars smashed. Look at the size of this hail. This is coming from just one Twitter feed. This is 4 inch hail. Looks just like the Argentine hail. And the uh, other record hail we've been seeing through Australia and New Zealand. Grand solar minimum much. As predicted, folks, this is the region where large hail outbreaks could happen. Currently, the areas in orange here are the most susceptible. Heads up. I wonder how uh, Anita Bailey, PhD, fared. She's up in that heavy hail region. We'll be talking to her on Wednesday, so we'll get an update. Winter storm warnings already in effect for the mountains up here in the Appalachians due to winter storm Skylar, the third nor'easter, which is predicted now to bomb out somewhere here over the mid-Atlantic. And the models are shifting rapidly because they do not know what is going on, folks. So heads up for the potential of one to two feet in the mid-Atlantic up through Boston with a very tight gradient between no snow, tons of snow, rain, and high winds. We're looking at a storm to bomb out to 940 millibars sometime in the next two days off the coast here. And if it shifts either way or the coronal holes add space weather, energy to this storm, oh, we could be in for a doozy. And there are tens of thousands of people that are still without power in that region. But you're not hearing about it because the mainstream doesn't want you to worry. Now here's the low pressure system that's bombing out. Here it's at 985 millibars. Tuesday, March 13th, 978 as it is off the coast. This is when the heavy snows will be coming to New Jersey, Long Island, Boston, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. And it looks like New Hampshire, Vermont are going to get hit as well as eastern New York State. This is going to roll up here. So the current model is showing these isobars stacking up on Maine. The coast of Maine could be dumped on here. And the tip right here, Nantucket. Oh, dear. Boston, you could be looking at a foot or more. And this these models are, being, are very poor. So that's definitely happening. And at the same time, heavy snow is going to impact the Sierras. Two to three feet could be falling. Wednesday, March 14th. And there's going to be heavy flooding the day before or earlier in the day on Wednesday. So we're going to be watching this third nor'easter in as many weeks develop. Southern Indiana, southern Ohio, heads up, coming through you all the way through southern West, West Virginia. And most of Virginia is looking to be in harm's way here. Ice Age 2050, kiddo, you're going to get yours. I think you might get a little action out of this event. You're going to be right at the center of low pressure here, 994, right offshore from your region. So get outside and get some good coverage of this storm because anything can happen in the next 24 hours. These models are going to change. That's a heads up. Major flooding hits Queensland comparable to the 2009 flood event. 
underwater. Major flooding is affecting the north tropical coast of Queensland, Australia, following our four straight days of heavy rain. This flood situation has been has seen communities isolated. Children were uh, rescued recently from a school that had been stuck there for days. Because highways are being cut off with the overall flood impacts comparable to the flood of 2009. This is all due to cosmic ray flux. In the next two years, these events are going to intensify in a scale of up to two to three times. Rain and quick thaw brings floods to the Balkans. Early spring after harsh winter brings inevitable springs to Serbia and Albania after they experience record snows meters of snow this winter and that's all running off in these rain events this is all due to cosmic ray flux stratospheric radiation increasing as we descend into the grand solar minimum and as the waning magnetosphere of our earth and the poles flip every uh, you know all info is in the poles are flipping folks you're in the middle of a magnetic pole flip on planet Earth. It's actually a magnetic excursion currently. It will not be a pole flip unless the positive and negative poles switch position on our planet. But we're currently in what appears to be a magnetic excursion, which will result in a pole flip. Now, as that happens, and as the sun reduces its intensity in this grand minimum, we have a multiplicity of effects allowing more cosmic radiation to enter our atmosphere. And here is the raw data. Almost 20% increase in New England, 13% increase in California, and this is the Northern Hemisphere numbers causing flooding wor uh, worldwide. I'm going to leave you links to the Google Scholar scholarly articles on cloud nucleation and cosmic ray flux as I put it in the search bar. There are seven PDFs coming from Svensmark and CERN. That would be Jasper Kirby. He worked, he's the head of CERN there, of the cloud project. So you've got the two heads and all of the paperwork. So you can do your own homework and get up to date on how cloud nucleation and cosmic ray flux is related and what it is going to mean for us, albedo effect. And the rapid cooling of the earth, climatic changes that are going to cause the empire that we now exist in, causing these lights down below here to, to run so effortlessly to be a thing of the past in the near future. Not only are we talking about the cosmic ray flux causing cloud nucleation, which will increase the albedo effect, which you have eight papers to read about. But during these times of high cosmic ray flux, it has now become very apparent to volcanologists that silica-rich magmas are excited with a change in viscosity causing catastrophic volcanism globally during high cosmic ray flux periods. This is also coupled with massive tectonic events, including a very high probability magnitude 7 or greater on the New Madrid in the coming years. And huge earthquakes in New Zealand, Indonesia, and around the Ring of Fire, including the Cascadia subduction zone, which could be a mega thrust. So as we descend into the Grand Solar Minimum and we report on these events that there is a definite uptick in volcanic activity worldwide, there is increased stratospheric aerosols on multiple fronts. Not only is the increased volcanism adding aerosols to the atmosphere here, some of these eruptions are adding stratospheric aerosols to the stratosphere up above that boundary. And at the same time, increased cosmic ray flux is causing increased cloud nucleation at all levels. The most ef uh, effective part of the cloud nucleation is in the lower atmosphere between 15,000 and 25,000 feet, which is why so many of you are noticing what appears to be chemtrails behind the over 14 million flights daily that are leaving our major airports, when in fact these are just contrails that are lasting for extended periods of time for miles because of the cosmic ray flux causing 
cloud nucleation along those particular aerosol points. The atmosphere and stratosphere you've been living in your entire life is different than it has been for thousands of years. And these are the effects we're seeing. I'll leave you links to all of this. Worldwide Volcano News. Ducono Reventador Sabancaya erupting. We have continuous volcanic ash emissions from Ducono. We have an ongoing volcanic ash emission from Reventador. And we also have Stromboli being reduced so that the tourists can get up there. And this is bad news. Access to the summit area has been officially reopened just in time for the tourist season. And every time they've lowered an alert on these volcanoes, they re-erupt. So look for a re-eruption of Stromboli and some tourists to be fried. And that is my prediction in the coming four months. Tourists at Stromboli will die because the powers that be need money and they don't care about your safety. Kirishima Volcano, we just watched the massive eruption occurring there. Care of Volcano Watch. If we look, take a look at the seismic update, the only motion of any significance is on the mid-ocean ridges. That's because the KP has been up due to space weather activity because of the filament that detached just three days ago and now coronal holes coupling with the Earth. So that's going <coughs> to cause a little less, less earthquakes worldwide, especially in the large magnitude, which we are seeing right now. A little bit of seismic quiescence. Let's talk about ice seven inclusions in diamonds. And we're not going to talking about this diamond here. This is evidence for aqueous fluid deep in the earth's mantle. What do we mean by that? It means earth. There is liquid, a large reservoir of uh, high pressure water deep in the earth. And they just determined that this paper is just coming out yesterday. Now here we're looking directly at ice seven, which is a cubic form as far as the mineralogy is concerned of ice or water. And this water can get in this particular orientation only at a certain pressure. So this ice seven is formed at very high pressures, likely in the outer core area. Ice seven is a cubic crystalline form of ice that can be formed from liquid water above three gigapascals, which is 30,000 atmospheres, which is uh, very deep in the earth. Being a scuba diver, I know that. By lowering its temperature to room temperature or by decompressing heavy water, D2O, ice 6 below 95 Kelvin becomes ice 7. And we just looked at the crystal structure, which is pretty awesome. And here's the paper, and you'll get links to all that. Something huge is about to smash into the Earth. A huge Chinese space station is crashing back to Earth, although authorities say there's nothing to fear. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Heads up. I don't believe these authorities, but hopefully this will burn up. Authorities are well aware that China's Tiangong-1 space station is doomed and will eventually end up crashing back to Earth, and there is some concern, however small, that chunks of it could fall in populated areas in Southeast Asia. Are you hearing of Southeast Asia? Your own satellite is coming to haunt you. Let's talk about solutions. This is coming from the Minnesota Conservation Funding Guide. Manure and methane digesters. This is top information on <coughs> anaerobic manure digesters, also called methane digesters or biodigesters, which collect manure and convert the energy stored in its organic matter into methane. Some of you may say methane. It's all the same. It's fart gas. It's used to produce energy, gas, or electricity for on-farm or all farm use. Now we were just talking about these with the with the cow fart bags that the insane alarmists in California are mandating. But if you own a farmstead or a homestead and you're prepping for the grand solar minimum, considering these devices um, should be your top priority. It turns manure into a source of renewable energy. It protects water quality by reducing manure runoff. Methane digesters for fuel, gas, or fertilizers is a great paper by L. John Fry, one of the first people to do all the calculations. You can actually do it in a sludge pond. Um, you can do it in 55-gallon drums. 
There's lots of ways to get this uh, gas out, to compress it, and to use it for cooking your food, for powering your house and your equipment. I'm going to leave you the two key PDFs, including the first one here by John Fry from 1973 with complete instructions for two working models of fuel gas digesters to produce methane on your homestead. <clears throat> and the most recent one coming out called Biogas Digester by Coolhane and Solar Village is what a biogas digester is and how to build it. And these, they're working in third world countries creating energy from nothing, from people's trash. This paper will tell you how to do it. They show you a, a perfect model that you can build yourself and step-by-step -step instructions, as well as links to videos on how to make your own biogas. So you can collect your own compost tea, fertilizer sludge, and methane to cook your food. If you're not doing this, you're not doing anything. You can even use it to heat your house and your greenhouse. There are so many potentials for this. We're going to get working on this in the summer, and we are going to probably make a unit on this scale with a huge outer concrete tank with the help of volunteers, and we're going to get going on these biodigesters. I can see our, our acreage having five or ten of these and just everyone having a party. You know, dozens of people being able to cook and heat with unlimited fuel that just keeps going and going. Talk about sustainability and self-reliance. How come you weren't taught about this in school? Because they want you to spend money at their uh, seven multinational corporations. They don't give up about you. I do. So I'll leave you links to this PDF. That's a heads up. And a boom to huge amount of knowledge coming out of this 20 minutes. Let's talk about cold times and Anita Bailey, PhD. She's going to be joining us for the entire month of March on our radio show, which is at freedomslips.com every Wednesday night from 10 to 12 Eastern, 7 to 9 Pacific. Now the first episode and the first discussion we had, which was two hours jam-packed of information on the first three chapters of her book, Cold Times, happened last Wednesday. And we'll be po posting that to our YouTube channel tomorrow. So make sure to check that out. This Wednesday, we'll be ch talking about chapters 4, 5, and 6, which is how to secure your food, how to grow your food, how to provide your family with food, how to secure water, location to secure water, how to purify water. These are the two keys that will keep you alive and help you survive and thrive in the coming times. Guys, we're headed into a cold period. More and more scientists um, are coming out of the woodwork to support the things that we've been saying for years. Um, this is because they realize that their lives are at stake like everyone else's. As we descend into this cold period, it's not the cold that gets you. It's the catastrophic events that slowly pick apart the infrastructure that our world has become so reliant on. First, the food st stops being delivered. Then the electricity gets shut off for extended period of, periods of time in regions. And then people become... Uh, agitated. The global unrest begins. Where this will start, no one will know, but it is going to happen because historical evidence suggests that it has happened every single time. There is not one piece of evidence to suggest that this will not happen, and that is the, the truth. And we're about talking about the truth. So read up on those biodigesters. Start learning how to grow food. It's spring. Spring is sprung in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're learning how to survive and thrive in the coming times, subscribe to this channel. Share it with like-minded people. Listen to our radio show and start doing your own research. Time's wasting. Be safe, everybody.